uh, hers is an example that has um, many similar cases. Uh, depression has been um, a malady from which uh, a good portion of the human race suffers, at least at some point in their life. And that is something that we have managed to uh, come to understand a little better and to deal with the various kinds of uh, uh, antidepressants. I'm here thinking of chronic uh, major depression, not the, mm. the occasional blues that mm -hmm. every normal brain gets. Uh, things can go into a, a bad state, and uh, it used to be we didn't understand at all what was going on. Uh, we do now, and uh, drugs like like uh, Lexapro and Fluoxetine and all of the uh, serotonin uptake, uh, uh, reuptake inhibitors have uh, improved a lot of uh, thousands of people's lives. Uh, th these are things on the good side. On, uh, on the whole, I think the good things are going to outweigh the bad things, mm. but uh, I'm an optimist, and um, one has to be careful here. We're talking philosophy. It can sound a lot like biology or neuroscience. In, in the case of Patricia and Paul Churchland, they're very close to the same thing. But this is not what they're uh, expressing here today, universally held view in the philosophical community. I want to uh, open the door to another philosopher right now to bring some of that onto the table, if, if he'd be good enough. Colin McGinn joins us from Miami, Florida. He's professor of philosophy at the University of Miami, author of The Mysterious Flame and the Making of a Philosopher. It's been a couple years now since we've spoken, but it's great to have you back, Colin McGinn. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello. It's glad to be here. So here we are. We're getting the church lens view of where philosophy and neuroscience may meet and interact. Give us a sense of the pushback that's been uh, that this is th this approach is generated in the philosophical community. Well, I'm getting into this discussion in the middle, of course. But let me let me just respond to the kinds of points that, that came up. I'm sympathetic to the positive side of what um, Pat and Paul are saying. I think anybody would recognize that it's important to know about the brain in trying to understand the mind, especially if you're interested in more psychological questions about the mind, not particularly limited philosophical conceptual questions. So I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of acceptance of that idea that we should know about the brain. It's a fascinating subject, and great strides are made all the time in that subject. But, you know, what, what should we conclude from that, that other approaches um, to thinking about the mind are worthless? Well, that's where I'm, that's the negative side. I'm not so happy about that. So two things struck me in the, in the remarks I was listening to just mm. a moment ago. Pat saying, well, conceptual analysis is pointless because you can't discover about the brain through that. Well, obviously you can't. You can't make empirical discoveries through conceptual analysis. Mm. Does that mean that it's completely pointless to think about one's concepts and try to get clear about them when thinking about certain questions about the mind? No, I don't think so. I think it was quite important to think about our concept of consciousness and figure out whether we've got different notions of consciousness which were confusing with each other in trying to give some kind of account of how the brain um, generates consciousness or deals with it. So I think conceptual inquiry can have a role. It's just that the mistake of some old-style philosophical approaches was to think it was the only thing which is, was of interest. So I'm opposed to the idea that um, neuroscience is the only thing of interest if we're interested in the mind. I think there are many approaches we can take. Well, well let me ask you... I mean, you you're a big-time philosopher, then, when the notion is put out there, and I don't know if I'll articulate this exactly correctly, but that conscious, there's no th other thing that is consciousness, that consciousness is just is, is simply the brain, doing what the brain does. That is consciousness. Uh, as a as a Bigfoot philosopher, do you, do you accept that, Colin again? No, I don't. I mean, that's, uh, as you've just explained it, that would be just classic materialistic reduction, which is the idea that you can reduce consciousness to a brain process like neurons firing. That's something which I wouldn't uh, think was plausible anymore. I mean, it's, it's, a very, it's a very dogmatic view in a way, because why, why should we assume that what's described, how the brain is described in current neuroscience explains what consciousness is? Maybe the sciences of the brain and of the mind will, gen will change in all sorts of ways, and it'll turn out that consciousness is dependent on some other aspects of the brain, which we don't even talk about. So what might it be beyond neurons firing? As well, we a philosopher, know. how do you look at that? We have no idea what it might uh, what it might be beyond that. People have tried to come up with ideas of the correlates of consciousness, with you know, not make great success. Um, but no doubt, there's something in the brain which is a correlate of consciousness. No doubt, something about the brain explains it. But to think that you know what we now know about the brain is an adequate explanatory basis, I think, was, would be something. I don't think Pat and Paul would accept that. But there have been philosophers who've thought that. They've thought that. It's just straightforwardly true that pain is C-fiber firing. We know that there are C-fibers, we know that they fire, we know what neural firing is. Pain is that. 
Well, that seems to be a dogmatic position because why would why should we assume that that is what pain is? Maybe it maybe it's not. Maybe we we need to have a much more um, theoretical revolution to understand mm. things like pain. Let me put it to the church ones, Pat, Paul. Neurons firing not necessarily enough, not necessarily nearly enough to understand consciousness. What do you say? Well. It's very important to realize, of course, that neuroscience is in its infancy. I don't think anybody thinks um, within neuroscience, and certainly I don't, and Paul doesn't think that we have an adequate explanation of consciousness or an adequate explanation of pain. Um, but in the case of pain, I mean, it's very clear that C fibers play an extremely important role in pain. What are C fibers? Uh, uh, well, yeah, okay, let me just say a little bit about that. Um, there are nerves in the periphery of the body. So let's suppose that uh, you put your hand on a very hot stove. Then there are going to be signals that go from your hand up through your arm into the spinal cord and up into the brain. And some of those fibers uh, are called A fibers, and they, uh, tra their signals travel very fast because those fibers are what we call myelinated. They kind of have insulation on them. And there's other fibers that are evolutionarily very old, and they're called C fibers. And both of those fibers are important for feeling pain, and both of them carry signals, but the C signals are a little bit slower. So and there's the technical, are, but, but Colin and McGinn they are says, nasty. Right, but even if you understand it, that he's saying, is that really enough to build a, a theory, a, a philosophical theory of consciousness on? There may be so much that we don't know. Well, of course, that's my point, is that neuroscience is in its infancy, and nobody thinks that uh, signals in C fibers are the be-all and the end-all. But, you know, it's also very important to understand that in the domain of consciousness, we've actually made quite a lot of interesting progress. We're beginning to understand what happens under anesthesia when you lose consciousness. We're beginning to understand the difference between being in deep sleep and being awake and in a dreaming state. Um, between being in vegetative state and not. Uh, we are beginning to understand at the level of the neuron the difference between paying attention and not. Now, this is all a beginning, and none of us has ever claimed, and of course, McGinn is setting up a straw man here, but none of us has ever claimed uh, that we have a complete explanation for these things, but we do have a very large tiger, and we've really got this guy by the tail. Mm -hmm. Colin McGinn, do, do you think science will ever explain it all, or will there always be a role for the philosopher beyond the latest scientific frontier? Well, in the case of, there will always be a role for philosophers if we're not considering questions about the mind. There are many other parts of philosophy, of course, which mm. philosophers are interested in. But if we're considering the mind, there will always be a role for certain, in certain questions about the mind, because there are always going to be some conceptual issues. It's very unlikely. Suppose, suppose neuroscience develops in some very radical way, and it becomes as sophisticated as physics is now. There are still many philosophical questions about physics that, that philosophers think about. So it's, it, it seems to me not really on the cards that we get to a point where philosophers had nothing to say about the sciences. There would always be concepts that are used in the sciences, which are you know, general concepts that need to be analyzed and understood and be clear about. Colin, again, I know we just have you for another minute, but I wish you'd leave us with the big, what big question we should be asking as, as we listen to the church lens here uh, about the intersection of, of neuroscience and philosophy, a sort of laymen and women looking on and listening on to you pros duking it out here. What, 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 are the question you, what question would you leave us with, Colin, again? Well, the point you, you were just raising that, that Paul raised earlier about whether ex extensions of our knowledge of the brain might make us stop using our normal mental concepts like emotion and thought and so on. I, again, I find that to be overreaching. I don't think that's very likely. Uh, I think that there are different levels of description of reality, and we find a, bit, a more basic level. We found the physics underlying chemistry. We don't stop talking about chemistry. In the same way, I will find out the mechanics in the brain of the mechanisms which subserve our mental our mental lives. I don't think that would lead, and that would be very interesting and worthwhile. I don't think that will lead us to abandon all talk of ordinary talk of the emotions, and so I will keep that talk. And I think it'll be it'll be useful. So. I'm just I'm just skeptical about the idea that um, that neuroscience is uh, is the complete account of, uh, of everything and will eventually subsume everything about the way we talk. I mean, the novels will be written in the language of neuroscience, for example, seems to me rather doubtful. Mm. Colin, again at the University of Miami, thanks very much for joining us for a few minutes today. My pleasure, Paul.